Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then, you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I feel like I've been having a lot more connection with my listeners through the Q&As and polls. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. Hey guys, welcome back to season three of A Catholic's Perspective, the podcast about being a young Catholic surviving in a secular world. Today I have with me Father Frank Pavone. He is a Catholic priest in uh, Titusville, Florida. He is a full-time pro-life leader, director of Priests for Life, and was national co-chair on Pro-Life Voices for Trump. You can find him on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, some other places, and we'll link all of those below in the description. So, Father, you've done so many amazing things um, for the pro-life movement, and praise God that Roe v. Wade uh, has been overturned. I'd love to kind of just get to know you a bit more for the listeners and and how you got involved in the pro-life movement. Absolutely, Amber. Well, it's great to be with you. Thanks for all the work you do online. I, I follow it closely and am uh, very uh, encouraged and inspired by what I see. You know, pro-life has been important to me ever since I was 17 years old. And uh, that was just three short years after Roe versus Wade. I uh, was uh, in high school. I was a senior in high school. And uh, I heard that there was going to be a bus trip to Washington for the March for Life. Now, I'm sure that many of our audience have been to the March for Life or certainly have heard about it or seen it online. And I went. I was in public school. I wasn't particularly tied in, you know, to the church or the pro-life movement, which was very young at that point. And uh, I was so inspired, Amber, by what I saw, the size of the crowd, the enthusiasm, the faith, and the faith coming from all different um, parts of the body of Christ, bringing them together under this issue, uh, the, the, the differences in the crowd of age, of ethnicity, even of political diversity, all these people coming together on what was a bitter cold day, by the way, this was January of 1976. And um, wow, I was so uh, awakened is the word I would use to the importance of the issue of abortion and to the to the greatness of the pro-life movement. So that lit a spark in me. Um, it was not that I had personal experience with abortion or even with anyone who had had an abortion. For me, it was very uh, much uh, intellectual and experiential in the sense of connecting with the movement. Mm. The more I, I, I read and studied uh, about abortion, the more alarmed I became. And it was like an alarm going off in my mind that was getting louder and louder and louder because I said, if we're killing babies, you know, what kind of a society are we building? How can we survive as a nation? How can we survive morally? Uh, and, and, and I just grew into that as more and more time went on. It was at that very same time that I was experiencing a call to the priesthood. I had rediscovered, I had always been a practicing Catholic, but I kind of rediscovered the beauty of the faith and got into it far more uh, deeply and intentionally. I prayed more each day. I started going to mass each morning before going to school. Uh, and as I say, I went to public schools. I started reading the scriptures more. And this was all happening at the same time there in, uh, in 1976. So I ended up going into the seminary right after high school with this newfound uh, interest in the pro-life movement. And from there, as the years uh, went on, these two aspects of my vocation, priesthood and pro-life, have grown together uh, very, very, uh, uh, very, as much as an integral aspect, one of the other. That's amazing. Wow. And you said you were 17. I think it's crazy because especially in high school, around that age these days, that's really when people end up falling away from the faith. 
Um, and not to mention, you didn't go to a Catholic school. You went to a public school. <laughs> I mean, to have a priest come out of public school and I mean, and become a priest right out of high school. That's absolutely phenomenal. Is there anyone you credit to really pursuing the priesthood in that direction or anything? Well, yes, yes. Uh, well, first of all, well, I had a pastor. Like I said, my family, we went to church every week. We weren't really involved with the church much beyond that. But my pastor, and I say this very deliberately when I use these words, he was a saint. A saint. Mm. In fact, his great uncle is a saint, uh, Blessed Philip Rinaldi. Uh, the pastor of our church in Corpus Christi in Porchester, New York, was Father Peter Rinaldi. The man was a saint. There's no anybody who knows him and got to know him during those years would agree. The man was extraordinarily holy. So he was my first spiritual director. And uh, the day I went into his office and said, Father, I'm thinking of becoming a priest. He had never, now he had seen me around the church. Like I said, I had started going to daily mass, but he had never said anything to me like, oh, well, you should be a priest. Or are you thinking about being a priest? Some of the parishioners said that, to me, but he, he never said that to me. But when I said to him, Father, I'm thinking of becoming a priest, you know what he did? He put his hands on his head and he said, ah, oh, he said, that's just what I've been praying for. <laughs> wow. Isn't that beautiful? It's just what I've been praying for. And um, and at that point, you know, I started going to him regularly for, for spiritual guidance. Uh, I didn't know at the time that it was spiritual direction. You know, we weren't using that term. He would just invite me over and we'd have a talk, you know. And right. He, of faith, about prayer. I remember him saying to me, and I'm sure all of our audience will appreciate this. I'll never forget one of the key, and he was a Salesian, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that. This was a Salesian parish. So the Salesians of St. John Bosco, following the spiritual teachings of St. Francis de Sales, who's my patron saint, by the way, uh, Francis de Sales has some very powerful spiritual teaching about peace of soul. And uh, the words, of course, that come from... Uh, uh, St. Therese, let nothing disturb you. Uh, and so I remember Father Rinaldi saying to me uh, in spiritual direction, he says, let nothing ever, ever disturb you. I can still hear his voice and see his face say that to me. And that's a bedrock principle of the spiritual life, right? No matter what's going on, do not lose your peace of soul. Do not lose it. Because once we lose it, well, then the devil can do his work. Temptation enters in. Things become cloudy. We become weak. No, no, no. Don't ever lose your peace of soul. So these were some of the dynamics that were going on. So I credit him. But you know what I also credit for my vocation to the priesthood? This is going to sound uh, unusual to people. My study of mathematics. Oh, interesting. Math was my favorite subject in school. And my teachers, to their credit, allowed me to advance beyond the class, because they saw I was bored in class. I wasn't bored because I was uninterested. I was bored because I already knew the material. Because I was so interested in the material, I went ahead on my own and, and studied all the rest of the, the rest of the course. So they were sending me to uh, high school for my math classes, just my math classes when I was in junior high, and they sent me to college while I was in high school. When you go forward in mathematics, it gets more and more abstract. Right. You start dealing with concepts like infinity, okay? Well, the concept of infinity is not that far away from the concept of eternity. And when you study the mathematical laws of the universe, it's natural to ask the question, where did those laws come from? Who's the lawmaker, right? right. So mathematics led me to start thinking philosophically which then led me in turn to start thinking theologically. And it got me actually to turn to the Bible, learn more about God. And then all those things that I described earlier started kicking in where it was sort of like a, a renewed discovery of our wonderful Catholic faith. That's amazing. And honestly, thinking back on some of the greatest philosophers of our time, many of them were involved in mathematics or in some sort of... Um, math even if they didn't think it was math there was some sort of math they were involved in and it's it's very interesting um and so and you know you know amazing. amber in regard to that it, i i always like and now i like history very much as well but back then 
I would have to say math was my favorite subject. History was my least favorite subject. <laughs> no, I don't know if I could have articulated it then, but I understand better now why that was the case. Because math is extremely predictable. I mean, it's mm. not predictable. And you get that with mathematical formulas, algebraic equations. Well, they, 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 there's no exceptions. They're always going to work the same way. History is exactly the opposite, isn't it? I mean, history, you're That's dealing true. with behavior. You're dealing with fallen human nature. You're dealing with conflicts. You're dealing with changing circumstances. You're dealing with things that nobody could possibly foresee. We just had the, that we just had the anniversary of 9-11, right? I mean, right. Who knew that day what was going to happen, right? So, so history is like just the opposite. You gotta, you gotta be dealing with the unexpected and sometimes uh, the unexplainable, or the at least the unexplained. Um, it, 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 so it's not a surprise that you know when you th when you study things like math, you know you're training yourself how to think, uh, and you're training yourself how to respect the laws that are built into uh, the universe. Which is so true, especially, you know, we live in a chaotic world today, but I always say the only way we know it's really chaotic is because of the news, you know, it's always pushed in our face now, whereas, I don't know, back maybe 100 years ago, we didn't really have a news source. I mean, we had newspapers and things, but now it's at the tip of our fingers. We don't wait a month or a week for a letter from somebody about an event that happened months ago. We, right. we now have everything at the tips of our fingers, like, in seconds. Um, and so when we live in such a chaotic world, it can be easy to feel overwhelmed, um, I think, in, in a lot of ways. And so history was one of my favorite topics, but something that always interested me was like the wars, you know, like what led us into yeah. the wars and what made us, you know, get to that point and what procedures could have been, you know, I mean, looking back in World War II and things, in Poland, when Divine Mercy was just starting to come out, mm -hmm. Hitler had just taken over Poland and priests were getting killed left and right for just simply being priests. Um, yeah. And so it's very scary from a Catholic's perspective looking back at history because we've always been persecuted in some way. But something that I really like is that we always succeed and we never die out. Right. It's interesting. Isn't that true? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And one of the signs of God's presence and, and favor. It's so true. And so I guess, well, bringing it back to like the pro-life side of things, now that Roe v. Wade is overturned, unfortunately, I've been hearing a lot of pro-lifers saying that their job is quote unquote done and they've stopped doing their pro-life work. So what really happened when Roe v. Wade was overturned and why does it mean we need to fight even harder as pro-lifers now? Well, the, the nutshell reason is the court basically said to us in, in the Dobbs case, which overturned Roe v. Wade just a couple of months ago, the court said to us, listen, we're not going to stand in your way anymore, pro-lifers, go ahead and do your, keep doing your work. We're not going to stand in the way. Because what was happening for 50 years is that the court was standing in our way. We would work very hard to persuade people about the need to protect babies and to stop abortion. We would elect people who believed the same way. They would work on laws. We would lobby them. They would vote on the laws. They would get them passed, only in the end to have it struck down by the courts. It was like, you know, this this losing battle is like, yeah, we know we're right. And yeah, our arguments are persuasive because look, people are being persuaded and they're electing people and the and those elected people are passing, passing these laws. And we kept running into this roadblock of the court saying, oh, no, 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 it's not constitutional to protect these babies from abortion. You got to allow abortion. That's what Roe v. Wade said. You have to allow it. The state cannot prohibit it, except in the very latest stages of pregnancy, okay? They drew the, right. quote, viability, which has its own problems. We could talk about that separately. So what happened now, after 50 years of this, what happened now is that the courts literally, it was one of these moments in American history, and there have been a few such moments, when the court stood up and said, we made a big mistake. Now that, that's, you know, there's a spiritual dimension here that we could think about. It. That's, that's a profound act of humility. It's mm -hmm. act of repentance. And when you read the Dobbs decision, I mean, these, these, these justices are saying, yeah, we made not just a mistake, we made a big mistake on a very, very consequential matter. And it has done a lot of damage to America. Okay, so how are we gonna correct that mistake? What they said was, Ladies and gentlemen of America, 
we, the Supreme Court, are not taking a position on abortion. And this is very important for our you know, pro-choice friends to understand. It's not like the court took a position on abortion and said the unborn have rights, they should be protected. That's not what the court said. What the court said was, if you, the people, through your elected representatives, pass laws that do recognize the rights of the unborn and that do protect them, even from the very beginning of their lives, there is nothing in the Constitution that requires us, the court, to stand in your way. Right. And that, now, now, that's not a hard concept to get. The court is, in other words, is just kind of backing off and it's saying, listen, this is why you have lawmakers. This is why you have Congress. This is why you have state legislatures. This is why you have elections. Vote for the kind of people that that you believe uh, that that believe like you do on this. Uh, if you want to make that the issue, and and go to it. Right. That's why going back to your point, which I see this too. I hear this also. Um, people saying, "Oh, well, well, we don't have to do pro life stuff anymore. We won." No, we, we didn't win the final victory. We won what I call a milestone victory. A milestone victory, it's a milestone. It changes things, okay? It enters, brings us into a new phase. But it's time to work even harder because those children are still not protected until we protect them. All the court is saying is we're not going to stand in your way. The court isn't saying they have to be protected because remember, the pro-abortion people, they have the same freedom to elect the kind of people that will that will keep abortion illegal. They have the same kind of freedom to, to, to pass laws that permit abortion instead of prohibiting. So the battle is on 100%. And in a sense, now we have to work even harder. And we should be working even harder because now our work will have more effect. When we pass those laws, they're actually going to be implemented instead of struck down by the court. Right. Not that makes things understandable for, for, for people. No, for sure. And I think it's important to like, also understand that there are tons of people in your state, you know, I think I live personally in Illinois, and Illinois is one of the most ah. choice states ever. Yes, it is. Um, it's very hard. There's so much work we can do here. And now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned, we can actually really start making a difference in who we implement into our governors and our mayors and things like that. And so I also highly suggest like, don't give up. You know, we still have such a hard fight ahead of us in individual states now. Um, each state can now decide whether or not to ban or um, accept abortion. And right. and so, it. I mean, you're in Florida. So <laughs> Florida is a very pro-life state, thanks to your governor, which is awesome. Yes, um, he's really great. But I also know that there's still work in Florida that needs to be done. You know, it's a never ending battle. Well, the governor, I mean, Ron DeSantis, I was with him just recently, by the way, and he's very, very uh, committed to, to pro-life. And he recently signed a, a bill into law protecting babies at 15 weeks, which was the same kind of law Mississippi passed, which led to the Dobbs case, as you know. So right. but but we've got and, and that was very significant for Florida because. And we have a lot of late term abortion facilities here, you know, going well into 24, 28 weeks. It's it's tragic. Um, but there's more to do. There's more to do because 15 weeks, I mean, still, there's a lot of abortions happening. There's a lot of abortion facilities in our state. Uh, and we, we need to do more. We need to do more to protect more of these babies. So Florida is one of those states where, like you said, it's fundamentally it's a pro-life state, but the protections for the unborn are such that there is still a lot more work to do. And this 15 week law was just very, very recent. It just went into effect right after the uh, Dobbs case came down. So, um, but we've got good opportunity here, but I wanna give people a word of encouragement because even in states like Illinois or New York, where I'm from originally, or California, which is pretty bad also, even in those states, it is no longer possible for any pro-abortion person or any legislator or any judge to ever say again that abortion is some kind of federal constitutional right. They mm -hmm. can't say that anymore. Now, what the pro-abortion people try to do, they try to put it into the state constitution. Okay, but it's harder for them to do that now. And we've mm -hmm. seen some judges, uh, Amber, on the state level hesitate about finding a, quote, right to abortion in their state's constitution. You know why? Because they're, they're looking at the reasoning from the Dobbs case. Mm. 
Mm. The Dobbs case is, hey, wait a minute, we all believe in privacy, okay? Privacy in the sense that there's certain things we cannot share in terms of information, and there are certain things that when we make decisions like in our families about certain matters, the government shouldn't interfere. Okay, so there is obviously a legitimate privacy interest that everybody has, but none of those privacy rights uh, you know, what am I going to do with my leisure time or what am I going to uh, what school am I going to send my children to or whom am I going to marry or you know, and none of these things the court pointed out mm-hmm. in the taking of a life. When you start going into the realm of a choice that means the ending of another life, you are in a unique category and you cannot use privacy or liberty to justify that. What the court said was we've never done that in our history. We don't justify killing by invoking privacy or liberty. Now, if the Supreme Court is making that argument to say that abortion is not in the federal constitution, judges on the state level, and certainly we the people, can make that very same argument. What Dobbs has done, even in Illinois, Mm -hmm. take away from the other side the... The, the 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 excuse they've been using for decades of just hiding behind the judges, right. they hide behind the courts. Oh, oh they, it's, it's almost like they don't have to make their case about why abortion's a good thing. They just invoke the courts and they say, oh, well, it's a constitutional right. Well, sorry, you can't say that anymore. If you want to convince the people and the lawmakers abortion is a good thing, you're going to have to convince us. You're going to have to make your case. And Amber, you know as well as I do, they don't have a case. They don't. You you can't justify abortion. You just can't. It's the killing of a baby. And uh, all their arguments fall apart under close scrutiny. And now in the light of the Dobbs case, you know, they think they got to come out of hiding. They can't just hide behind the robes of the justices. They got to come out and make their case. I completely agree. And I think now it's harder than ever for some people to really be pro-life due to the fact that like, even as Catholics, because we have a president in the White House that claims to be Catholic, but goes completely against almost every Catholic teaching. Yeah. Um, so how can we keep our mind and, and stay pro-life in these troubling times when we have so many false leaders among us and, and wolves in sheep's clothing? Right. The, the, and, and this is exactly one of the reasons that the Catholic bishops are concerned about uh, what, what Joe Biden is doing and saying, and also Nancy Pelosi because they know that they have been entrusted by the Lord with the responsibility to guard and teach the faith. Mm-hmm. Not Joe Biden, not prominent Catholic politicians. They're not the ones who be, get to define what it means to be a Catholic. So the bishops are the primary teachers, and even they, okay, are, they're, you might use the word derivative. Mm-hmm. What I mean is a bishop doesn't get up and teach the faith with authority because it's his own idea or his own conclusion. Same with a priest, a deacon. We get up and preach and teach because we've been ordained to do so in the name of Christ and the church. So in other words, we don't have any right to teach or preach something that is contrary to what the church has always taught. So people would ask, well, what's our anchor when there's so much confusion? You got prominent Catholics like Biden, you know, confusing people like crazy because they're saying they're Catholic and they're they're saying then the exactly the opposite. And, and remember, he's not just disagreeing with the church about abortion; he's actively promoting it. Right. Nothing required him to 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 issue an executive order after the Dobbs decision to make abortion more accessible. And yet that's what he did. Nothing requires him under the law or certainly under the faith to to push Congress to pass this this Women's Health Protection Act, as it's called, which would expand abortion uh, even more than it's than it's been legal. Nothing is requiring him to do that. He's and, and Pelosi, too. They're pushing for more abortion. So it's not just a matter agreeing and it's not just a matter of weakness either you know some people say oh but you know we have to have compassion on them they're weak and sinful just like the rest of us listen being weak and sinful is one thing stumbling along on the path of discipleship yeah we can all uh, identify with that yes they're not stumbling along on the path of discipleship in their advocacy of abortion they're running in the opposite direction so 
the guidepost for us in the midst of all this confusion is, is just those simple words. People need to remember this phrase, what the church has always taught. Because mm -hmm. if a bishop teaches something different, you know, we don't, we don't judge him or why he's saying what he's saying. We might not even understand what he's saying. Sometimes a priest or a bishop might say something. We say, scratch our heads. I never heard that before. What's that? Where's that coming from? In a sense, it doesn't matter. Because the beautiful thing about the Catholic faith, the whole Christian faith, is that it's wide open. It's just, just as available to you and me as it is to the bishop and the pope. They don't have any extra books of the Bible that we don't have. They don't have any extra chapters of the catechism that we don't have. The church, the faith is open and available and understandable to us all and all of us, including clergy, are responsible to that message, what the church has always taught. We're not authorized to change it or to hide parts of it that we don't like or to distort it or to make it easier or to make it harder than the Lord himself has made it. No, it's so true. And it doesn't just fall on our leaders, but it also falls on like social media groups. There's a social media group called um, Catholics for Choice. Um, which you and I both know is in completely impossible. It's completely false. You cannot be Catholic and pro-choice. Um, but some people use Biden as an excuse as to why it's fine. Um, and you know, but but why is that? Im why is it impossible to be Catholic and pro-choice for those who might be thinking, oh, well, it's not that bad because I'm supporting a woman's choice. What can we say as Catholics and defeat the people who claim to be Catholic and pro-choice? Well, would it be Catholic to 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 say it's okay to kill a newborn baby um, or to kill somebody in the streets, you know, gun violence, for example, or the the kind of acts of terrorism that we see going on? Again, we recently had this sad memorial of 9-11. You know, if, if, if you ask the person that, they would say, well, it's not Catholic because it's not human. It's not it's not Catholic because it's just not decent. It's it's barbaric. It's it's just wrong. Be and and people say that right away because what they're focusing in is the uh, is, is on the action itself. Mm. Never say, oh well, you know, it's not good to abuse a child, but you know, if a mother uh, it chooses to do that, I will respect her choice. We don't think of child abuse in the category of choice, because our mental focus is on the abuse, not the person choosing to abuse. But when it comes to abortion, somehow the other side has, has, has gotten people to switch around the focus. And instead of the focus on the action, they're focusing on the process. Who's the person choosing it? Well, yeah, maybe. Maybe she's choosing it, maybe she's not. Because a lot of the abortions are forced abortions, or at least forced by circumstances. Um, but putting that aside, the way we cut through this is we ask, well, what is being chosen? If what is being chosen is the killing of a baby, then as far as the Catholic faith is concerned, that's all you need to know to say that it's wrong. It, 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 it's not the church's position on abortion comes from the natural law and from human reason, it, it, it's not primarily a matter of revelation. It's a matter of, hey, I know abortion is wrong, just like I know that killing a newborn is wrong, just like I know that killing an adult is wrong. And that's where we start. And that's why it is uh, is so clear to us that something like Catholics for choice, I mean, why don't they just say Catholics for abortion, right? Because they know as soon as you start focusing on what the action is, people are going to reject it. Right. And I actually think that group was actually started by a Protestant group. Um, and so it's very, it's really crazy to me because they also deface like a church um, during the March for Life. There was like this whole yep. news thing about them. It, yep. It's absolutely crazy how unhinged, you know, pro-choicers are really. Um, and then Well, Amber, you know, you know what I said to them when, when, when they did that, that, that when you referred to during the March for Life, they put, they, they projected those words on the, uh, was on the National Shrine of the yeah. Conception, right? You know what I said to them at that point? What? At a press release, they said, oh, you bunch of cowards. It's as if you really wanted to show your support for abortion, why didn't you project on the on the basilica an image of an aborted baby? Right. 
Isn't that what you're doing? And that's abortion. What's the matter? You're ashamed of it? And in fact, they are. You see, this shows how cowardly they are. And this mm-hmm. is cowardly Biden and Pelosi are too. They'll get up and they'll talk eloquently about, oh, you know, well, Biden, not so eloquent. <laughs> uh, but they'll say, oh, yes, the right to abortion, the right to abortion, the right to choose women's health. Okay, fine. When are you going to describe what an abortion is? Right. I said to those Catholics for choice, get a picture up there of abortion. You're right. So- you want to sell it? You want us to pay for it with our tax dollars? When are you going to show it to people? See, they know full well, just like we do, that if they started showing it to people, people would be absolutely horrified. They would not support it. It's so true. And I especially think nowadays we have to be very careful with our words because they've warped so many words, you know, and what they mean. They they make it sound like choice is a good thing. And it's like, well, yeah, God gave us free will. We have the choice, but a choice to do good or to do evil. Right. Um, there, there is really no gray area. You are either with Christ or you are with Satan. Um, and I just feel so bad for all the women who have been lied to over the years who are clear victims of abortion and being lied to and thinking they've done the right thing, but then realizing later the effects of abortion. And um, I've had so many women who have emailed me who are looking for healing and, um, you know, praised God, that those if um, that those women who have contacted me thinking about doing abortions have actually chosen life, but uh, um, you know, I guess the main thing though is that I've discovered a few places where women can go for these resources to help heal from abortions. You know, like yes. Rachel's Vineyard, and yes. I think Project Rachel is the same thing. But in your experience, have you do you have any other resources that have helped women either heal from abortion or give them information about it before? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you mentioned this because, you know, Rachel's Vineyard is actually a part of our ministry. Oh, wonderful. I'm the pastoral director of Rachel's Vineyard throughout the whole world. And this is, in fact, the largest uh, ministry for healing after abortion. People come to weekend retreats. Uh, to gather together confidentially with uh, several others who have been through the same thing and with professional counselors and clergy uh, to walk through for a few days both the pain and also the the redemption uh, that Christ brings. And it's done through the power of the word of God and the sacraments. So Rachel's Vineyard, very, very powerful ministry. Um, And uh, I'm going to give people a special website where they can connect not only with the Rachel's Vineyard uh, sites, but actually there are dozens of other ministries too, not as big as Rachel's Vineyard, but dozens of others that are through various different models uh, leading people to the healing after abortion. And when we say people, we're not only talking about the moms uh, who had the abortion, we're talking about the dads also, Talking also about the grandparents. I mean, these parents, sometimes they were the ones that forced their daughter to have an abortion or pressured their son to force the mother to have an abortion. Uh, They suffer too. They suffer regret as well. A lot of people need healing. The siblings of the aborted babies, think about them. Or the friends. What about a friend who drives a friend to get an abortion or a friend who helps pay for an abortion? Then they realize later on, wait a minute, I I took the life of of a human being. They go through grief and pain and distress as well. So when we talk about the healing after abortion, we're talking about a wide circle of people who are involved in different ways. So I want to give you a website where people can connect with a wide range of ministry in the place closest to where they live. And folks, if you write this down, you may have a friend one day that needs this help and you'll know exactly where to go. It's simply abortionforgiveness.com. And abortionforgiveness.com is a website we set up. You put in your zip code and it plugs into the databases of Rachel's Vineyard and various other ministries that are operating nationwide. There's no place at all where people might live that they can't uh, find something reasonably close to them. Abortionforgiveness.com. And and Amber, one more resource. Many of those who've gone through these healing programs, just like we see in the Gospels when people were healed by Jesus, remember how they want to run off and tell their story? Yeah. 
just told them to be quiet. And they went off and they talked anyway, you know. So they but 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 this desire to share your testimony with others, it's a, it's actually a, a it's an it's an outflow of gratitude. Right. You're grateful to God for what he did to you. You want to share that that gift with others. So we have a campaign called Silent No More. And when I say we, it's a project of Priests for Life and Anglicans for Life. So mm. interdenominational project. And what it is, is very simply, I mean, aside from what we already said, spreading the word that forgiveness and healing are available. What this is, is if someone wants to share their story of their abortion, we help them, first of all, discern, because it's a, it's a discernment. Is this the will of God that I should share my story? Feel they want to? Well, then maybe it's the will of God, but you have to consider a few other things. But we guide them through that process. And once, once it's clear that they should be sharing their story, then we give them the opportunity to do that. And people can find these stories at abortion testimonies. So before we told you abortionforgiveness.com, now abortiontestimonies.com. Again, people can look and see, they'll see different categories, late-term abortion, abortion after rape, but it's, it's all different kinds of circumstances. And wow, the stories are so powerful. And that's actually a tool that everyone can use to help in two things. First, you can help dissuade someone from an abortion. Uh, and second, uh, but, but but simply by by sharing these testimonies, well, wow, I didn't know people suffered so much. And secondly, you can help somebody who has had an abortion, but maybe they're they're unsure if God even loves them. I mean, they don't love themselves anymore, and they don't know if the church will ever accept them again. And, and you let them listen to these stories, and they will see that yes, there is redemption, there is forgiveness, there is peace that can be obtained after abortion. It's so true. And there's so many amazing people out there who are willing to help these women. And, you know, I'm a certified sidewalk counselor and, you know, I've spoken to some women who just, they, they feel like they're in fight or flight mode. And yeah. the only way they can survive is if they get an abortion because maybe they can't make rent or they don't have a car, they don't have a job. And, you know, those crisis pregnancy centers um, are located all over the world. And, you know, if you are contemplating an abortion, crisis pregnancy centers will help you for free. They'll give you a free ultrasound. They'll they'll help you out financially. I know of a crisis pregnancy center where a woman said she was getting an abortion because she didn't have a car to drive to and from work and the pregnancy center bought her a car. Um, right. And so there are resources out there. People do want to help and you are not alone in these situations. You know, millions of women have struggled with this and will continue struggling with this if nobody reaches out a helping hand. And that's why we're here, you know, is to give those resources and to help those women and to spread the awareness of all of this. Yes, this the help is available. People are working on this day after day. The uh, Fortunately, the pregnancy centers outnumber the abortion facilities by about a four to one margin. Of course, that margin is increasing now as the uh, more and more abortion facilities close in this uh, time after Will V. Wade. Uh, and, and, and nobody should ever despair. In fact, there's another website, pregnancycenters.org. Hmm. Well, just like I said before about abortion forgiveness, where they can type in their zip code and find the help closest to them. So it is with pregnancycenters.org, they can type their zip code and find the pregnancy center nearest to them and uh, receive the help either for themselves or someone they know uh, who doesn't know what to do about their pregnancy. So pregnancycenters.org, uh, life-giving uh, help and hope. You know, because Amber, when you think about it spiritually, the, 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 the work of the pro-life movement in saving people from, from having an abortion and saving the life of that child is to replace despair with hope. Right. As a sidewalk counselor, they don't go to the door of the abortion clinic because they're thinking, oh, let me exercise my freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. It's not why they're going there. They're going there because they feel they have no freedom and no choice. They're going there because of despair. So when we go there, the other side wants to say, oh, well, we're harassing them. We're not going there to harass. Them. We're going there to give them hope. We're going right. to tell them you're not alone. We're going there to tell them there's a better choice. We're going there to tell them Listen, you don't have to be here coerced in your despair, feeling like there's no other option. There are other options. 
And we are the people of God and we are here to help you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Father Frank, for coming on yes. and sharing your testimony and, you know, yes. providing the pro-life movement so, with so many more amazing resources. Um, where can my listeners find you? Well, I'm going to give you one website, which encompasses everything we were just talking about, and it's endabortion.us. U.S. is the is the is the domain there endabortion.us and you'll find the links to the, all the different branches of our ministry including as you mentioned at the outset my social media platforms that i hope everybody connects with me on and that's where of course uh, with all the things you're doing it, it's so much fun to be connected on social media so i hope that your audience uh, connects with me as well at fr frank pavone but like you said you'll put the links up uh, yeah. They'll see them also on that web that web page, uh, endabortion.us, where you hope to hear from folks and let's stay connected with each other. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much again for being on. Um, hopefully we'll have you back on in the future. And uh, thank you so much. God bless. God bless you too. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. I hope this podcast was helpful for anyone who maybe might be struggling with abortion healing or wanting to know more about how to be Catholic and pro-life. And with all of that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to A Catholic's Perspective with me, The Religious Hippie. Make sure to visit my official website at thereligioushippie.com, and while you're there, be sure to sign up for my newsletter to keep up to date with my latest news and offerings. You can also find me on virtually any social media site as The Religious Hippie. Thanks for listening! A quest is a search for something. And every week, the Quest podcast will show you how we know what we know, through interviews with people that have incredible stories of dedication and perseverance. I'm your host, Todd Fisher. Join me in this thought-provoking and inspiring podcast of discovery. Find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at hm.com. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and Anthony Smith and is distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure and visit the official website for Metacortex Publishing at metacortexpublishing.com or find us on social media for other unique content.